Hello and welcome to another edition of Garden Hour. My name is Amanda Bachman. I'm the SDSU Extension Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Field Specialist based here in Pierre, South Dakota, and I will be your host this evening. Joining me tonight, we've got the gang back together again with T minus three weeks remaining in the season. Um, looking forward to hearing from all of you. Christine, what are you going to be talking about tonight? I'm out of practice. I've been gone so long. Um, I'm excited to give some updates on flower trials, both on campus and at McCrory Gardens. Awesome. Cannot wait to hear about those. And I'm looking forward to visiting them later next month. We also have Dr. John Ball joining us again from his travels. Last I heard you were in Hawaii. What's up, John? And why did you come back? I, I sometimes wonder, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but the big island was great. Anyway, uh, tonight, I'm not going to talk about the Hawaii uh, travels, but I am going to talk about the continuing drought and heat impact that has on our trees and shrubs. Lots of calls on that. And I'm going to finish with a brand new toy you all got to buy. Awesome. Can't wait. And we have Dr. Rhoda Burrows, who's with us from Rapid City. Rhoda, what is new out west? What is new out west? Uh, <laughs> you, you got me on that one. <laughs> I was all ready to say, well, I'm going to, to talk about a smattering of different subjects. So it's sort of a smorgasbord tonight. Okay, sounds good. And for the folks joining us at home, please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box. And I will sort of field those to our experts in between the segments. You can also keep an eye on the chat box for links and other important information. And I know, Rhoda, I think we're going to be doing squash bug questions like for the rest of the season. So we've already have we already have a squash bug question. So get ready. All right. <laughs> but with that, uh, Christine, I will turn it over to you as our first speaker. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, as I'm pulling up my screen, tell you what, folks, if you are itching to hit the road or need one more road trip before school starts, um, Trial gardens and botanical gardens are just looking gorgeous across the Midwest in general. I had the pleasure of going to Chicago Botanic Garden about two weeks ago. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, our partners up at the University of Minnesota Morris, the West Central Research Station there, they just had their horticulture night at the end of July. Things are looking great up there. I know North Dakota State just had a big open house event. And as a reminder, they are home to the largest collection of daylilies in North America. And boy, would it be a great time to go see those in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, and of course, last but not least, I'll be pitching McCrory Gardens in uh, a couple more slides. So it really is the time to shine for all things flowers. Um, some of you might be aware or might even know someone in your local community who is starting to produce cut flowers. We do have a small but growing contingent of cut flower producers in the state of South Dakota, and they are doing this for commercial production. You might find that you're able to purchase a bouquet subscription um, from some of these folks. Many people are doing on-farm cut flower you picks or um, you know, have putting together displays for, for weddings and events and or doing pop-up events at local boutiques or stores. So um, definitely look into some of the local cut flower producers in your area. Here on campus in Brookings, South Dakota, I decided to start dabbling in cut flower research as well. We really don't have a lot of information for Midwest cut flower production. There's some great and growing resources coming out of Utah State and some of our other um, partners a little closer to the Midwest, but I decided it was time to figure out what's gonna work well for South Dakota. So this year on campus, we have replicated cut flower trials of four different cultivars of zinnia and four different cultivars of snapdragon. And what you see on the left is a photo of our zinnia trial. I was also going to be looking at how those plants did with different cover crop treatments, but those didn't take quite as well. So really, it's just a variety trial this year. And that's okay. It's keeping us plenty busy. Um, and what you can see in the photo is one thing that you do with cut flowers is you use a horizontal netting. Um, it's probably no surprise to anyone that here in South Dakota, wind can play a huge factor in knocking around those big, long, tall stems. This is especially important for snapdragons as they are really um, 
sensitive to having stems that are bent, they'll curve upwards, they're, um, they respond to negatively to gravity. So even if you're storing snapdragons, so if you're transporting them, you would not want to transport them in their side in a box because they will start to curve upwards and you'll have really funky stems. Um, so we've got those snapdragons and zinnias on campus. Um, the zinnias were seeded on April 26th. They were planted in the field on June 6th, which was a little later than we would have liked. But as many of you know, we had a cold spring. We had those cool soil temperatures. And then we did have a lot of rains around Memorial Day. So that kind of delayed our field planting. Um, the zinnias were pinched once. We did that to encourage branching so that we would get multiple stems of blooms. And and that doesn't come without sacrifices. As you may um, be able to deduce for cut flowers, we want nice long stems. 18 inches or longer is really um, the target to be marketable in the cut flower industry. Um, we're currently measuring and grading all of our stems, looking at anything that's eight inches, um, eight to 12 inches, anything shorter than that, I'm considering a non-marketable stem. And for the home gardener, you might be like, you know what, I can throw that in a mason bar jar or a small little container and that's no big deal. Um, but we're, we're trying to think of this through a commercial lens. And then we look at um, 12 inches to just below 18 and then 18 inches or longer. So we're looking at what is the stem length of these different crops, especially now that they've been pinched. Um, so we've been harvesting zinnias July, through, um, I expect that to be the end of the season. Snapdragons, we harvested a week earlier. They did do quite well despite the heat. Um, I would say peak harvest of snapdragons has definitely passed. Um, those plants are now recovering. We've fertilized again to encourage new shoots and new growth. And I do hope to see a second harvest in the fall. So stay tuned. Um, Watch for some online articles after garden hour has ended for the season and look for some updates on snapdragons. So what zinnias are we growing? Um, these are the four cultivars that we have this year, Benary's Giant Purple, Zinderella Peach, Queen Red Lime, and then Oklahoma Ivory. Having the job of naming um, zinnia cut flowers, um, new releases, that sounds like the sort of job I would enjoy. Um, the Benary's Giant Purple really does have nice large purple blooms. The Queen Red Lime, my students and I have decided that one kind of almost looks vintage because even when it starts to fade, um, and we do try to harvest these zinnias when they have multiple sets of open blooms. Um, for example, if you look at the Benary's Giant Purple, I would harvest the bloom on the left and the bloom on the right, I would probably wait another five to seven days to, to harvest that one. But again, that queen red lime, beautiful vintage color. This Oklahoma ivory has just been nonstop yellow blooms. When they start to go downhill, they do look pretty brown and crummy. Uh, brown and crummy being the scientific term for that, of course. Um, but all of these have had a pretty nice vase life. Um, I haven't done any replicated trials of vase life yet. It's just been observations on how things are doing at home. One thing we've noticed with that Zinderella peep is they have a very unique bloom. Um, it does come in kind of a variety of colors. We were starting to think that maybe we had mixed up some seeds, but no, there just is a lot of variation. Um, but that one's been a bit tricky this year for a cut flower. The stem length has been really, really short. So that's one I'm I'm watching, um, we're not getting a lot of marketable stems, but again, with some more heat and um, as we head into fall and have more time for growth, perhaps we'll see that one catch up. So that's just a little bit of an update from the cut flower field. Now, what about McCrory Gardens? Um, we have some really fun trial projects going on that I'm involved with. And just as a note, McCrory Gardens does have trials above and beyond this. These just happen to be the ones that I interface with. Um, so we are a trial site for All American Selections. And that is a nonprofit trial program that works with um, works with university and botanical gardens across the United States. And they will send us 
annual bedding plants to trial. We have no idea who the breeder was. We have no idea what the plant is called. They just assign it a random number. And then we compare that marigold, for example, to two other marigolds that are already on the market. And that is helping breeders determine, um, you know, how well that plant's performing if they want to target, you know, the Midwest market or the East Coast or the West Coast market. Um, to see how those plants are doing. So if you see an All-American Selections logo on a plant tag, know that that plant was trialed at um, multiple um, research sites across the United States. We are also a trial site for the American Rose Trials and Sustainability, or ARTS, and that is a trial program that is based on a three-year rotation, and we are trying to identify or the, the researchers are trying to identify the toughest, most low input roses for the United States. And again, they have this organized by region. And so McCrory Gardens became a trial site three years ago and that's replicated research. And we look at insect damage, heat tolerance. Are those roses showing any signs of um, black spot or any disease issues? The funnest part about being a rose trialer is we actually have to comment on, does it have a scent? Can we notice it? Do we like it? Um, and you also comment on, you know, is it in peak bloom? Is 25% of the foliage covered in blooms? And you give those plants an overall rating. And again, we don't know the exact names of those roses. We're hoping after the three-year cycle is complete and we know what's done well at our site, that they will then release those names to us. So stay tuned. That one is still, we haven't completed an entire three-year trial of the roses yet. Um, and then building on the legacy of work that Dr. David Graper started for annual and perennial trials at McCrory Gardens, we have 34 containers and 61 different bedding plants for annual flowers this year that we're trialing. And those are from two different breeders who have sent us plant material. The McCrory staff grew that out in the greenhouse, transplanted it into the gardens at McCrory Gardens. Again, I want to say it was the first week of June just because of weather conditions. And then the herbaceous perennial trials, we have 42 different perennials. And um, each year we they plant about 12 to 15 new perennials. Um, and again, those are on a three-year cycle. The point of that with the perennials is so that you have at least two winters to see how um, those perennials overwinter in South Dakota conditions. What do we look for when we look at these trial plants? Myself and McCrory Garden staff were out there, um, we're each out there at least once a month. So we're trying to lay eyes on plant material every two weeks. And we use an evaluation form where we're looking at plant uniformity, health of the foliage, how do the leaves look? What's the growth habit? If it's a plant that's supposed to trail, is it trailing? If it's a plant that's supposed to be compact and have lots of branching, does it actually do that? Um, you know, how is it covered with blooms? Is it actually self-cleaning? Do birds or butterflies or bees appear to like this plant? So those are all the types of questions we ask ourselves as evaluators. And that helps us assign a score from zero, it's dead, it's terrible, we should never plant this in our gardens, all the way to five. Oh my gosh, it's absolutely fantastic. And all of that information is going to be gathered together and put into a research report at the end of this season. And we do have reports from 2021 that highlighted the top performers in both the annual and perennial trials from last year. And we can certainly share those links before the end of the program. All right, so if you're going to be in the neighborhood anytime between now and September 24th, we are trying to select the People's Choice Awards. So we would absolutely love to have you come to McCrory Gardens, check out our perennials, check out our annual in-ground plants and our annual containers, and vote for your favorites. That's also a chance for you to be an evaluator yourself. Um, it's, a, it's a pared down online phone form. You can come with your phone and use the QR code and fill out the data sheet. Um, it's essentially asking for you to rate your top three plants and tell us why you like them. And we want to curate all of that data from as large a data set as possible from the public to be able to um, get your feedback on what plants you like. So again, if you get a chance to visit McCurry Gardens, please look for that. Um, if you'd be interested in seeing the tr trial gardens up close and personal and getting to listen to me talk about it a little bit more. Um, we are gonna have a pop-up event next Thursday, August 24th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in Brookings at McMurray Gardens. 
and we'll be walking through the perennial trials as well as the annual trials. And again, you're going to have a chance to vote that night on your People's Choice Award. So that's one of the three events that I highly recommend you attend if you're in the neighborhood. Um, for our West River friends, another event to put on the calendar that's going to be coming up in a few weeks is the Youth and Family Services Harvest Festival. This is in partnership with SDSU Extension. Many of my West River colleagues are helping work on this event, and that'll be September 10th from 10 to 2 Mountain Time in Box Elder, South Dakota at their, um, their newer farm, educational farm. There are going to be presentations and booths and games and food. Um, do look for my graduate student, Alexa. She's going to be out there with some demonstrations on cover crops, and there will be even be a chance to take home some cover crop seeds. So that's going to be a really great event um, for our folks West River who are looking for an event that's family friendly. And last but not least, if you would like to get up close and personal with all those cut flowers I talked about, plus see some broccoli and peppers, and see some presentations on vegetable insect pests, as well as on-farm food safety, we'd love to see you on campus on September 15th from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. for our field day. And Amanda, I think that's everything I've got for this round. And I know you'll have some more events to pitch as well. No one will be bored in early September. <laughs> yes, we've got a lot going on and we've got two questions for you that came in. All right. One about those cut flowers. What type of netting uh, did you use over those? So that is a nylon netting. And if you look up from various suppliers, um, you know, cut flower or flower trellising, it's a three by three nylon grid. It feels a lot like reinforced fishing line, if you will. And again, the key is to stretch that horizontally across the plants. We had a mix up earlier this season that it was put vertically. That won't do any good. Um, but you can get that in three by three inch grids or four, four inch grids as well. Awesome. And then how often do you fertilize your cut flowers? So those cut flowers were, oh boy, you're really <laughs> testing my memory. We, I know we fertilized at planting. We, we use a fertilizer injector. Um, so we are able to do fertigation because we have drip irrigation lines. Um, I want to say we have fertilized those three times, but I could come back with more specific rates and how exact volumes next week. <laughs> awesome. And if anybody has more questions for Christine, throw those in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end tonight if we have time. So with that, up next we have Dr. John Ball. So John, I will turn it over to you. All right, that sounds great. Let me get this rolling here. Ah, here we go. Well, my, my usual start is growing degree days. Now, for those of you that are really aficionados of this uh, sort of data. We're actually behind from last year. I, I know it sounds surprising. We've had an incredibly hot summer, but do keep in mind once the temperatures start getting above 86 degrees, they really don't add to our accumulation because really at that point, temperatures are not good for uh, plants in general. There are exceptions, of course. And as Christine mentioned, we got off to a late start. It was a very cool, cold actually April and May. Uh, and because we're a little behind at this point, uh, that's kind of slowed some of our insect development. So uh, our emerald ash borer is not quite as well developed as it was last year at this point. Uh, the larvae go through four end stars, that's four stages. And last year they were all in the third end star, which is a size that's actually doing a lot of damage to the interior of the tree. This year, there's still a lot of uh, second end stars like this one. A and they are beginning to etch into the tree and starting to cause a little damage. But uh, I expect in about another week or two at the very, very most, we're going to be at the third end star. And that's where they're literally plowing through the wood of the tree, uh, feeding on the sugars and actually disrupting the movement of water as well. And so we started to see the trees decline rather rapidly that are infested. And I would also like to remind everyone that it was just a few weeks ago where I found uh, emerald ash borer in Brandon, South Dakota. Not too surprising because it's only eight miles east of the original find, but nevertheless, it is continuing to spread. And quite frankly, if you live anywhere in Minnehaha or Lincoln County, I can probably find an infested tree relatively close to you. 
Um, and so as a reminder to anyone living in those two counties, if you do have ash trees that you like, uh, you should have been treating them this year, if not treating them already. And certainly you want to be put on the schedule for next year if you haven't started yet. Uh, it's pretty easy to find trees that are now standing dead from emerald ash borer, and we only expect that number to grow as it continues to uh, spread outwards. Now, uh, of course, everyone's out looking for emerald ash borer, and this isn't it. But this is the lineup of the usual suspects, and this is the yellow spotted jewel beetle, and it's pretty. It's a little bit wider than emerald ash borer. Uh, in fact, quite a bit wider than emerald ash borer. And of course, I wouldn't call this emerald green, but it is kind of a close relative, say a distant cousin, if you will. And so I'm not too surprised that people find this and think they found the emerald ash borer. Now, just an FYI, you're rarely going to find the adult emerald ash borer. And at this time of year, they're pretty much gone. But you are still finding some of the jewel beetles around and, and are so shiny that they do attract your attention. They do tend to kind of be walking on wood and that so they're easy to find. Now, this little insect makes its life as the larval stage feeding in decayed and downed trees, typically poplars, cottonwoods and that, which we have an abundance of. So it's relatively easy to find. When people come out for rally week, those bikers that believe it or not uh, do know something about insects. I mean, it's a national thing and you'd be surprised, but a lot of, uh, a lot of our bikers do report where they think they found emerald ash borer, and that's always appreciated. But this is the one that's frequently turned in as a suspect. Uh, fortunately, nobody's caught it in their windshield or on their throat uh, as they're uh, riding. But nevertheless, it's one that's often found. And nope, nope, it's not emerald ash borer. Pictures are worth a thousand words. If you think you found an emerald ash borer, send me a picture of it. Happy to ID it from that as well as go in and take a look at it. Uh, scale is always good. Thumbs are great scales. Your, your thumb size is relatively the same. And that gives us an idea of the insect. Well, you know what's out there right now is a lot of aphids. They seem to be enjoying this warm, humid weather. And I've been getting calls. Sioux Falls area is probably where I get most calls. Why? That's where most folks live. That's where most of our trees are in terms of ornamentals. And uh, this was a wilting or a drooping might be a better description. Northern red oak. And if you pulled open the droops, there were all the little aphid colonies. And of course, people are asking, well, what do we spray? Not a darn thing. Uh, these colonies tend to expand and contract rather quickly and lots of things like to eat them. So there's really no need to go out there and control them on this plant. You could already see the buildup of the lady beetle larvae, which find aphids yummy. And so let nature take its course. Uh, and they're going to do a darn good job of managing it. And really, I know this can look alarming and the honeydew can be annoying as it makes all your patio furniture a little sticky and such. But nevertheless, nature's well equipped to manage these. And, and that's probably our best way of dealing with this relatively temporary problem. The problem that we're seeing that I'm a little more concerned over is our premature fall color. Uh, particularly on the maples, because maples will turn a bright red. Now, for those of you who remember the flooding that occurred, what, about a decade ago or so, uh, we had a lot of maples turning red by July and August of that year as well. And the reason for that is they were standing in water. And standing in water is what we refer to as physiological drought. Uh, essentially, the plant is declining because of the lack of water from standing in water. Uh, roots require oxygen to survive, and those roots were not getting enough oxygen and were beginning to decline and not absorbing enough water. This time around, it's too dry and there isn't enough water to absorb. And so the green is kind of filtering out of the leaves and the reds are being produced. And in some cases, you're seeing other trees that are turning yellow. The yellow is always there, but it's unmasked as the green kind of fades away. This is a sign of concern. Uh, it's not a sign of joy. And we're also finding some of these leaves beginning to drop. And I'm getting the question, well, if the trees are already beginning to drop its leaves, should I still keep watering it? Absolutely. You want to keep that plant alive into next year. 
And so if you're in part of the area that's in drought, which is actually three fourths of the state, and if you're down in Union or, or Clay County where we're in extreme drought conditions, absolutely be watering your trees and shrubs on a regular basis. And a reminder to everyone that watering now actually improves winter survival, not the old GL water just before it freezes. That's a little late. And so if you know some of your trees turning yellow or, or in the case of the maples turning red, that's not a good sign. And that probably means get the hose out and water them. And most of the pictures I've received are trees that have been newly planted this year. So they already had a much reduced root system. So getting out there with a little bit of water, stand there with a cool drink in your hand while you're watering your plants. Sounds like a good plan to me. Um, and we're also seeing leaf scorch. It's just been too darn hot. This is one of my favorite maples, and that's hard to say because I'm not a big fan of maples right now, mainly because they've been overplanted. But you know what? There's always room for a couple. And the Korean maple is kind of a nice little tree. It's our version of Japanese maple. For gardeners that have lived elsewhere in this country, Japanese maple is just a delightful small tree with these wonderful deeply lobed leaves, very, very fine texture to it, bright red fall color. It's found in many, many, many uh, gardens out east and, and out west. Well, Japanese maple doesn't do well in South Dakota. In fact, if you even say South Dakota to it, it dies. Now, Christine mentioned the gardens up at the uh, Morris campus, and there they have a Japanese maple outside. But if you look at the base of it, it's still in a pot because they bring it in a greenhouse during the winter time. Keep it cool, not hot, but that's how they keep it growing there. Well, the Korean maple actually can grow fairly well in South Dakota. And it's being here's one on Augustana's campus, for example. It does have a very, very attractive leaf and can have a brilliant red fall color. But this tree is very susceptible to scorch. And if you plant it out in the open sun, where it's also going to get a lot of wind, and no matter how much you water it, it's been very, very hot this summer, uh, it will scorch. And this might not be the best picture of scorch I've received, but I've received lots of pictures of scorch on the Korean maple and the northern glow maple, which is a hybrid between the Korean and Japanese. And while that's certainly winter hardy, it is very, very prone to scorch. So uh, just a note, don't plant these trees where they're gonna be exposed to the uh, hot, dry Southern winds during our summertime. And they do do best in a light filtered shade rather than the middle of your front yard. Uh, cloudy weather, yeah, they do fine in. So if we have a cloudy summer and a wet summer, we're just good. But when we start getting these hot, dry, sunny summers like we're getting now, and Hawaii was cooler, by the way, um, then these sort of trees are uh, easily susceptible to scorch. They will come back, but nevertheless, they're, they're going to be damaged. And then just a couple more slides. But yes, indeed, one of the things we look at here are the male cultivars that are being reinforced being released. And of course, nobody likes the female trees. Why? Because they produce fruit. And just as a reminder, most trees produce male and female flowers, or every flower has the male and female parts to it. Uh, so they're going to they're gonna produce fruit or not. Uh, but we do have some trees that either produce only staminate flowers or pistillate flowers. And in those trees, we tend to select the cultivars that produce only the male flowers because we don't like the fruit. Well, as people have heard me say before, don't count on it. Uh, there's a lot of cultivars that tend to switch sex. And there's a lot that's mostly our male, but occasionally female. And this is one, the Espresso Korean, excuse me, the Espresso uh, Kentucky coffee tree. And this is one of several cultivars of coffee trees where I frequently see pods being produced. And this is on our own campus. It's called a cultivar we planted out, out here next to the uh, dairy bar for those that like ice cream. And I've seen this in, in Brookings, South Dakota. I've also seen it in Sioux Falls and a number of other areas where you'll find trees that are producing just an abundance of those 
pods with a very large bean inside. So my reminder to anyone, if you're going to go out and buy a tree and you say, well, I don't want the fruit, so I'm going to buy a male. If you really don't want the fruit, don't buy the tree, period, because you may be surprised within a few years or a decade or more uh, that you're going to find fruit being produced, whether it's a pod or a seed or some other means of, of propagating itself. But the pods are probably the ones that are most objectionable, but uh, fruit on crab apples, for example, or some of the others. So don't count on them staying male forever. And then kind of to finish it up, look at this. Is that awesome? That's the steel GTA 26. And I'm not trying to promote a single product out there, but they're one of the forerunners of some of the others. This is literally a hand saw, if you will. Uh, these are really easy to use. Uh, they weigh about uh, just under three pounds, well, actually about two and a half, 2.7 pounds. Uh, it's got a pistol grip, so it's pretty easy to hold. Actually, it comes with a holster uh, for those you want to look like you're packing. And the battery runs for about 26 minutes. And that's trigger time on the battery. So you're actually pressing it. It's got a little uh, cover for the blade on top uh, to help reduce injuries with it. But man, will this cut. Now, I wouldn't cut anything over about four inches in diameter. That's going to take a while. But if you have small trees to prune or that, uh, these have become incredibly popular. And uh, when you walk in someplace like I did about a week ago into the dairy bar for some ice cream uh, in between my pruning, you merely have to set it on the uh, table and everybody wants to look at it uh, because these are kind of handy. They, they run you about $170. They are for sale in dealers around South Dakota. Again, this is one brand of a number that are coming out, but I will say that Steel came out with one of the first ones, hence I'm kind of showing this one. But if you're really looking for a little pruning saw, and you don't want to use a hand saw, though those are still my favorite, uh, these have become incredibly popular, and our maintenance crew here at South Dakota State University just loves them for a lot of small pruning. And, and by the way, the batteries charge very quickly as well. So if you have two batteries, uh, you'll probably be pruning all day with one of these uh, little uh, saws. Uh, a reminder, though, these are pruning saws. These are not toys, despite the fact I mentioned them as toys. So do not put them in the hands of children in that. Uh, these are run by adults. But you know what? They run so quickly, you got to be careful with your pruning because you're going to be so impressed at how fast they cut. You might find you prune a little bit more than what you wanted to on a small tree. So just a note of caution with that. And with that, I'll stop sharing um, and uh, we'll kind of continue on unless there's a question that I need to answer. But uh, yeah, these little hand pruners, oh, are they, oh yeah, you all want one now, don't you? Uh, I feel like the 26 minute battery life is to like slow you down so you don't accidentally cut down your entire like tiny tree. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> like... That's literally, that's it. Cause it's like, oh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I, I took it into the dairy bar. And if you've got a holster with this thing, it, I mean, people are just going to look at you. Uh, so uh, be kind of cautious. But again, they are, they are an actual saw. So don't hand them to the kids. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, they attract attention and they, I, they may sound like a gimmick, but they actually are pretty cool little little toys, I call them, but they are tools. <laughs> well, question wise, we've got one. Uh, why is their mock orange shrub blooming again? Oh, hey, that's a great question. And I'm going to cover that in my next week's pest alert because we're actually getting magnolias and a couple of other plants that are blooming. And what happens is when they're stressed, and they are, um, uh, they will go through a little bit of a bloom period in August and September. Um, and so um, uh, mock orange, uh, magnolias, crab apples even, um, and a few lilacs are actually producing a second set of blooms. So thank you for ever mentioning that question. Now, again, it's a sign of stress. 
So it's just a, ooh, my tree, my shrub isn't doing very well. So make sure you're getting it watered. It will take away from the blooms next year because, of course, some of the flowers are opening up now. But no, there's no way you can stop it. <laughs> uh, so enjoy the flowers. There's usually not a lot of blooms on them. But, uh, you know, kind of like the red color, huh? it's kind of pretty, but it's kind of warning you it's not too happy. So uh, accept the blooms and water the plant. All right. Sounds good. Up next, we have Dr. Rhoda Burrows. So Rhoda, I will turn it over to you and then we can, uh, when you're done, we'll talk about squash bugs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I mentioned I have a number of things I'm going to talk about today. And that, yeah, many of you have probably already harvested your onions, but uh, if you haven't, uh, this is a good sign that you should go out and go ahead and do that. Um, when you harvest them, you want to put them in a place where they've got good airflow out of direct sunlight uh, so that they can cure for a couple of days, uh, get off the, the surface moisture, and then leave the foliage on. And again, put them in a warm, dry area after those few days for a week or two, and the foliage will help draw out extra moisture from that neck of the bulb so that it cures better. And once the foliage is dry, then uh, the whole bulb should be uh, ready to store. Um, yellow onions will last the longest. The purple have a lot of sugar, so they tend not to last as long. Uh, but anyway. Uh, Rhoda? Yes. Under under display settings, could you swap your screen? Am I doing this wrong again? Nope. I this think will just I give them right. a little. This will just give them a little bit of a bigger picture. Thanks. Next, I had a photo of a tomato plant or a number of tomato plants that really went to town, and it looks looks pretty wonderful. But then when I looked at the plant a little bit closer, I didn't see any flowers or tomatoes. And uh, this can happen if you've got too much nitrogen or if it's been too hot and, and the heat is destroying the blossoms. So, or a combination of the two can really uh, lead to, to the monster plant. Um, it takes, once your fruit, once the, the fruit is set, it takes about a month for it to go ahead and ripen. Um, so hopefully, if you haven't had flowers up to this point, hopefully they're setting fruit now that it's cooled back down into the 80s. And if we have a, a late first frost, you'll probably get some fruit yet. And another cause or another effect of too much heat is the broccoli doesn't form a nice big head. Instead, it forms all these little uh, like broccolini, uh, just just solid size as is. You don't have to break up the head. You just harvest these and and you're good to go. But but you're not going to get much of them. And and that's one of the challenges of growing both cauliflower and broccoli in South Dakota is when we get into those heat units at just the wrong time, uh, you can have trouble forming a nice head. It's not your fault. Uh, it's it's the weather's fault. So uh, look for heat resistant varieties uh, when you're picking out varieties. And then just a couple of comments about uh, one of my one of my pet peeves with with some of the produce that I find uh, sometimes at the farmers market, sometimes uh, with friends, is picking things too mature. And of course, this is easy to do if you missed a day or two and, or, or missed some fruit and, and went out to the garden and, and discovered it got away from you. But the ideal for beans is before the seed are obvious in the pod. Uh, so this middle is the ideal harvest time. If you look at the base 
picture here again this is not what we want you should not be able to distinguish the the seed once they get to this more mature stage you're more likely to have strings in the pods um, and they lose some of their tenderness and some of their sweetness uh, so aim for the middle uh, same thing with cucumbers if you get them too far along uh, you want them in this stage if you get them too far along the seeds start to form uh start to harden and so you know when you when you bite into it it's a little harder to crunch through you can even get holes in the middle and that tells you you waited too long this is the ideal one here on the right uh not so much on the left uh talking a little bit about post-harvest storage uh, if you put these warm season vegetables, uh, peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, green beans, and even musk melon in the refrigerator for storage, you bring them home from the store or the market or your garden, um, they'll last a few days in your refrigerator, but after a few days, they're going to start showing this chilling injury, and this is not just you know the mold started in but it's actually the cells were injured first and then the mold uh, started coming in the the uh, browning on the pods is also a of uh, the beans there is also a sign of chilling injury or darkening on the rind of the cantaloupe so uh, ideally you'd have a facility like a, a uh, cold storage area that, that's around 40, 45 degrees, even 50 degrees, they'll stay much longer in there. Um, otherwise, maybe on your counter for a few days and, and then in your refrigerator. Uh, but again, you know, you have to do what you what you can. But but if you're really looking to keep things for longer, you might invest in a small refrigerator or find a used refrigerator that doesn't uh, stay real cold anymore and and that might just be ideal or if you've got a root cellar even better and then finally i wanted to end with some pretty pictures uh, and this is related to what christine was talking about earlier tonight with the flower trials uh, there are also vegetable trials and these were three of the tomato selections for 2022 they do oh, about a half dozen vegetables every year and or i think they had several more this year than than usual but uh the first one is a pink delicious and there's something about that's related to the pink gene in in tomatoes is related to the flavor so that brandy wine flavor is often associated with the the pink color and this is a brandy wine like tomato however it has much better disease resistant and much better uh, uniform coloring um, and less uh, tendency to crack has some of the older heritage, but has has a good taste. So you might want to look for that next year. The purple zebra and the sunset torch are both smaller tomatoes. Um, both of these have some resistance to tomato spotted wilt virus. And so if you've ever sent me uh, a sample or had your tomato uh, diagnosed has been has having tomato spotted wilt you might want to look into these two varieties uh, they're starting to get more and more varieties now with some resistance it's it's not complete you may still get it under heavy pressure but it will be less less likely to get it and uh, purple zebra also has some uh, tolerance to late blight not one that we see a lot but but can get some time and then all three have the usual types of, of resistance to fusarium and and verticillium wilts uh, so 
uh, something to to look at and and as I look at this purple zebra I kind of want to reach out to my screen and and have a bite of it and that's it for for those and I believe we had a couple questions yes we do so we'll start from the bottom we'll hopefully go okay. with the easy ones first how long does sweet corn remain usable after picking oh boy uh, if it's if it's one of the super sweet varieties, it can be up to a couple weeks. Um, you've probably seen it in the store sometimes where it started to get dried out and, and <laughs> it gets sort of marginal at that point. But as long as leaves are still uh, moist and, and fresh looking, it's probably still good. But I've kept them in my refrigerator for a couple weeks sometimes when I just gotten busy and haven't gotten back to them. And then we had another question about uh, due to the heat, their pumpkin plants haven't set fruit. Now that it's getting cooler, is it too late for pumpkins to form and mature before the weather gets cold? That's going to depend on when our weather gets cold. <laughs> if we have one of those mid-September first frosts, eh, um, if it goes into October, like it does sometimes, uh, and it'll depend a little bit on the variety. Uh, generally, once the fruit is set, it can take about six to eight weeks at, at summer temperatures uh, to fully ripen. That's going to be extended a little bit longer as we go into cooler, cooler and shorter days. Although 75 degrees is actually the prime temperature for ripening for for uh, a lot of the cucurbits, including including pumpkins and squash. So it doesn't have to be that hot. It's just hopefully it won't get down into the fifth below the 50s. Uh, and that's when you can start to get some some damage. So you might want to do some some uh, row covers or something as it starts getting a little cooler. And then our, uh, our squash bug question, uh, this person's lost a couple squash plants to squash bugs. Should they pull them or leave them in hopes the bugs don't go after their healthy plants? <laughs> I think I would be tempted to uh, uh, gather them into a big garbage bag so none of the bugs on it escaped. <laughs> yeah. Or continued breeding. Uh, I yeah. do know some people that have been using vacuum cleaners to go out or shop vac <laughs> vacuuming up their bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say probably if you're going to go that route, like dedicate uh, one vacuum to the squash bugs because they do kind of like a lot of the true, a lot of the hemipterans, a lot of those true bugs have have an odor um, and have will 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 stink as a defensive mechanism. So maybe don't you know take the nice household Dyson out for that. Uh, <laughs> for that job um but yeah and you know whatever you try this year document your results and kind of see how it works um but yeah if there's i agree with rhoda if there's uh, squash bugs on the dying plants like just scoop them into the trash bag along with the dead plants and and get them out of the garden that way and definitely make sure to remove all of the squash debris at the end of the season so i am going to go ahead and share my screen and bop through my slides here pretty quick and I will answer the question about painted ladies um, at the end but as we um, get closer to fall I wanted to point out that bees need fall flowers I had a you know a neighbor on the block who was saying that they were going to be starting their fall garden cleanup and I'm like no it's too early <laughs> <laughs> One, because I'm, you know, not mentally prepared for summer to be over. And two, because up until that first frost, we've got lots of insects out there, lots of insects that we want to help out that need those nectar and pollen resources up until the very end. Uh, bumblebees are still going to be active. Honeybees are going to be provisioning their nests. You can see I got some like bees in flight. I was, you know, aiming for the, the bombus on my sunflower here. And there's just tons of bee activity out there right now. So uh, keep an eye on those fall blooms, encourage those fall blooms, water them, um, enjoy them, and, you know, 
hold off on the you can you can hold off on the garden cleanup for a little bit. And as Dr. Ball was talking about aphids on trees, I was like, oh yay, I have a aphid story as well for this week. Uh, I was down in Sioux Falls on Saturday at Bugapalooza, which was a great event. We'll be back there again next year. And of course, as I walk by any garden, I'm, you know, flipping leaves over and especially on milkweed just to see what's there. And this milkweed plant had a ton of aphid mummies on the underside. There were lots of ants on the plant, which was my indication that maybe there were going to be a bunch of aphids as well, because ants will sort of farm the aphids and collect their honeydew. And you can see all of these little sort of tan spheres. Those are all aphids that had an unfortunate run in with a parasitoid wasp. So the wasp laid its egg in the aphid. That egg hatched. The larva developed inside the aphid and then sort of turned the aphid into a nice little cute pupil chamber uh, where it could develop. And then it'll sort of like cut out a hatch and the, uh, the new uh, parasitoid wasp will emerge from the aphid carcass. So if you see little aphid balloons that look like that, um, you know, leave them on the plant is actually a sign of biocontrol working in your garden. And another reason to, you know, not spray aphids, um, especially on trees and milkweed and, you know, things like that, just because there are so many insects that rely on aphids as their food source. So they, I'm, I, you know, pro aphid, they're one of my favorite insects. And uh, this week, the frequently asked insect are the root weevils. Uh, these little guys are ooh, not quite, they're like a quarter of an inch long and they like to crawl, they don't like to fly, and they'll show up indoors for no good reason. Uh, they don't feed or reproduce inside. Outside they will feed on like lilacs, they'll sort of make like sawtooth marks on the edges of the leaves as they sort of cut out little semicircles, not as big as leaf cutter bees. Um, but yeah, they are sort of one of our fall kind of invaders and they'll show up in bathrooms and you can really just knock them off like into a container and chuck them back outside or you know flush them or whatever they're not something that really warrants any sort of chemical application inside the home um, and especially if you've got lilacs around you might see more of these um, they have of course the cute little snout because they are weevils so that's a good um, identifying you know factor on them but the blurry picture on the right is kind of the, the picture of them I get a lot like zoomed in on like a bathroom wall. So keep an eye out for root weevils. They're not going to hurt you. They're just kind of a, a nuisance this time of year. And while I was at Bugapalooza, one of the uh, booths had uh, mosquito larva in a container. So I made sure to take a picture. Um, this is your reminder that it is still West Nile virus season. Uh, cases have been pretty low. I think we've had like two cases statewide, about three blood donors. But if you have standing water in your yard, bird baths, if you haven't cleaned your gutters yet, um, you know, tires, buckets, uh, anything like that, make sure that you're going out and emptying those every couple of days. Even if you keep, um, you know, a rain barrel or have containers of water sort of lined up for watering, make sure that you're cycling through those so that you don't have the larva developing on your property. And then upcoming event wise, so Christine uh, talked about some of them and I was like, I will talk about the other half of the events. Uh, we've got State Fair coming up September 1st through 5th. Uh, we'll be in the Hort building. Uh, I believe most of us on the call tonight will be there giving presentations on one or more days. So check out our schedule of events there. I believe uh, Christine and I will be there like Thursday and Friday. Um, so that should be a good time. Thursday is value added ag day. So you can come out and check out some local producers as well. And then we'll be at Insect Fest on September 10th at Mercury Gardens in Brookings. So that's going to be a great time to check out maybe the tail end of the trial gardens and see some of the plants in person that we've been talking about today. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and go back to the Q&A. Uh, why are the Painted Lady butterflies always here in the summer? Well, Painted Ladies are super fun. They kind of migrate here, not quite as dramatic as monarchs, um, but their caterpillars eat a decent range of things. Uh, one of those things is soybean. What do we have a ton of planted out in our fields? Soybean. Um, so in soybean, the caterpillars are actually called the thistle caterpillar, and so sometimes people don't realize that that's the same critter that turns into the painted lady, but the caterpillar is kind of an interesting spiky 
um, spiky thing. Um, I have seen them on thistles exactly once, so they might offer a little bit of biocontrol there, but we see so many of them because they come out of our soybean fields. We have a huge, you know, area of, of food for them and they just have a great time. So yeah, so painted ladies, especially if you're in your soybean fields, that's where they're coming from. And then it looks like we had a question for John um, about the video that you made on pine wilt. Any idea where they can find that? Yeah, I tried to find it real quick uh, <laughs> and wasn't able by the time you, you asked the question. But uh, yeah, unfortunately today I was even looking at dead Scots pines down in Sioux Falls. And just a reminder everyone, we're losing more uh, Scots pines to pine wilt disease cross state than we're losing ash to emerald ash borer. It is our <laughs> statewide problem. If you, uh, I'll try to get it up for next week, but it's on the South Dakota Department of Agricultural, Agricultural and Natural Resources website under Forest Health. And we have a series of uh, monthly webinars I've been doing. And that's been an incredibly popular one. Why? Because no matter where you live in the state, from Dakota Dunes to Buffalo, we're losing Scots pines. And that's another tree that's on the no list uh, anymore. So, uh, and right now they are showing up. If your pine uh, died in, in a week or a month, yep, that's it. But it only affects Austrian pine and Scots pines. But I'll put the link up next week. Awesome. And we are getting really close to the end. So instead of asking for any remaining stumpers for us, I wanted to go around one more time to our panelists um, just to see what advice you guys wanted to leave us with this week. Uh, so we'll go with Christine first. All right, um, I think keep your plants healthy. I'm headed out to harvest peppers tomorrow and we have a lot of sun scald because some of our pepper treatments have not been very healthy and there's not enough foliage to protect those plants. So, um, you know, keep that produce watered, avoid over pruning those tomatoes or peppers and uh, hang in there. <laughs> yeah, avoid over pruning, put down the tiny chainsaw. Yes, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Although I want one too. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come on next week all with our tiny chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> so John, besides tiny chainsaws, any last uh, thoughts for this evening? Well, it, it, one that you and I have to discuss. And, and first of all, thank you for bringing up the, the root weevils. Yes, that little notching along <laughs> your lilacs. And by the way, for those that have use. Uh, you'll find those notch black vine weevil. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll find them wandering around your house. They're usually uh, up with me having a cup of coffee first thing in the morning, just a couple and, you know, fun for the cats. But the one you didn't mention, but I'll bet you mentioned last week and week before, cicada killers. Oh yes, my we talked gosh, about those last week. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those little mounds of soil along the sidewalks. Now, the most common question I get is, Will they sting me? Thank goodness, no. Uh, I'd hate to see people just paralyzed and stuff <laughs> down those little holes. Uh, and if I'm correct, uh, Amanda, and I know this is your area, it's the males that are most territorial, and they're not stinging at all, if I recall. But uh, I read somewhere, though, that if, uh, if a dog just tries to really go for that burl, they might get stung, but not enough to hurt them, but enough to remind them not to do that anymore. Yeah. And I did have a, a question last week that came in. Um, some, like somebody had essentially secondary damage from like badgers because, or raccoons or something, because there was an area with cicada killer nests and the mammal had come in and dug up the nest to get to the cicadas. Ooh, and so I was ooh. like, oh, that's, you know, usually that happens with grubs, but I'm like, I could see, you know, them being like, oh, here's this, you know, cache of nice, tasty cicadas and might as well have a snack. So, yeah, and, and you're right. And, and, uh, Doreen noticed, she says, I don't hear as many cicadas right now. <laughs> and then you looked and there was just about a zillion nests and you tried to walk down the sidewalk and the males, cicada killers were just like, nah, don't walk here. And it's like, come on. I'm a little bigger than a right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they they can look pretty intimidating, but yeah, they really don't go after people. Um, like they they really don't go after people. You mean you should say they don't go after people. <laughs> really means that occasionally. I mean, <laughs> you know, we cannot deal in absolutes. 
I oh, have a yes, land we on can. the hammock. Don't worry, people. <laughs> Ignore her. It's not going to paralyze you and stuff you down a hole. All right. No, I won't. <laughs> Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Eat, you might want to carry your little pruning saw as a right. weapon. Then. <laughs> oh, and Rhoda, parting thoughts for this week. <laughs> Water deeply. Not, not, not spritzing it several times a day unless you're trying to cool something off. But if you really want the water to get to the roots, water deeply and less often. Yeah, and hopefully we've got two more weeks of garden hour and maybe in some of the places across the state we'll, we'll get a turnaround on some of this. I feel like it's not as hot this week in Pier, but it's definitely still very dry. So we're gonna cross our fingers for some end of the season rain to help things get to fall. But until then, uh, we will be back here next week, same time, same place, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain on Zoom. Come with your questions. And if you don't catch us during garden hour, you can always catch the recordings on YouTube and feel free to submit questions through the website or you can email any of us and we'll throw them on next week. So until then, happy gardening. <laughs>